football season. You can have a great quarterback, but if you don't have any receivers, it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter how. And we have the best quarterback in the universe. His name is Jesus. Amen. But, but his work and will going forth cannot happen unless we've got some wide receivers out here. And so we've got to get our heart uh, ready to receive what the word has to say. So we're doing a series called Loving Him. Uh, and the basis for this is a lot of times we talk about him loving us. Well, are we supposed to just sit here and do nothing? No, we need to love him as well. The Bible says we love him because what? He first loved us. And that's the reality. And so there is an obligation for us to do that. And so we're in the midst of a sub-series entitled The Ten Commandments. And so we're looking at the Ten Commandments, uh, which was written and proclaimed in the Old Testament context. But how does that translate over into the New Testament context? Where we are, no, we are no longer living by the law of law, we're living by the law of grace. And so does it even translate over? Does it transfer? Or do we just take the Old Testament and just throw it in the trash and, or put it up on the wall as some sort of a relic? And so we're going to look at that today and see how uh, it plays a part in our lives. And so here's God's requirement, and this is a New Testament verse. Here's God's requirement. Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 36 to 38. I'll be reading that from the New Living Translation. It says, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in, in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Another translation says mind, soul, and strength as well. And it says this is the first and greatest commandment. This is the first and greatest commandment. Of course, we know as you read on, there's more to it. But we're focusing on that today. So just beginning with the fact of understanding it is a commandment, it is a requirement, it is an expectation uh, that we, we love him. I'll give you a small marriage example. Uh, for my wife, it is an expectation that I open the door for her. But I wasn't born with that in my brain or in my head, in my heart. At some point, she had to communicate that to me. Hun, as a part of our relationship, as a part of our Marriage here, my expectation is that you open the door for me. Uh, and, of course, uh, in our marriage talks, we'll go deeper. Uh, but, you know, th there's this thing, I think, for the ladies that, well, you should know that. If you love me, you would have done that. You would ever, you know. But the reality is, no, I do love you, but it doesn't mean that I know that if nobody told me that. And so then, is it something that was genuine, or am I just doing it because she told me to? And that's where we spend 30 years to figure that out. But the fact is, the heart of God is the same way. Listen carefully. Although it is a request, it is a requirement and an expectation, somehow he wants you to do it from your heart and not just because he told you to. And I can prove it to you. There's another verse in the Bible, which I didn't prepare for this morning, but it's there, that where God says, I'm tired of your offerings. I'm tired of your sacrifices. I'm, and then the people are like, well, wait a minute. You told us to do them. And he says, yes, with your, with your actions, you're participating in the love relationship, but your heart is far from me. And don't raise your hand. Some of us married and some of us who were, who were not married, but we were still laying next to somebody when we shouldn't. Listen, you can lay in the bed with somebody, but you're thinking about somebody else. Your, your spouse or your significant other thinks that you're faithful because you're there. You're there physically, but your mind your heart, your body, not your body, your mind, your heart could be somewhere else. And so this is what God is talking about. This is what God is talking about. And so we need to go through that process of aligning his desires, his wants, and his requirements with our desires so that it, it does become real. It does become real. And there's a way to do that. There's a way to do that. Uh, but it's a process, it takes time, and it certainly can take communication. Uh, I'll give you another powerful verse of communication. You know, the Bible says, without faith, is, it is impossible to please the Lord. And the Bible says, what is not of faith is sin. And so hopefully, our people, y'all find the verses for me, because this is not in my notes. God is just flowing. But there was a man who needed something to take place in his life. And you know what he said to Jesus? He said, help my unbelief. 
So he didn't have the faith which was required for him to be healed. He didn't have faith, therefore he was unpleasing to God. But because he was open about it, God says, I'll help you with the area that you are weak in. Jesus talked about the two who came to pray and how the one man came beating his chest saying, Lord, I'm a sinner, I'm this, I'm that. And the Pharisee was like, look at that bad person. And Jesus said, the bad person is better than what you thought was the good person because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So it's a requirement, but I'm not telling you to pretend like you're doing it just because God said so. I'm requiring you to dig deep. So you can have what? The, the, the Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you can be changed on the inside so you can more line up with his will and his way. And sometimes it takes time. Did you hear me? Sometimes it takes time. You, you, we might not just lay hands on you one time and you hit the floor and you get up fully transformed. It might be a process that you need to go through. But at least let's set our heart to go through that process so then how do we do this? If you love me, obey my commandments. We see that here in John 14, 15. John 14, 15. So if you love the Lord, here's what he says. Uh, uh, this is also uh, New Testament. Everybody say New Testament. Therefore, we can't skate around it. It's New Testament. If you love me, obey my commandments. So you can say you love me all you want, but he's like, here's one of the ways you can prove you love me. Obey what I'm telling you to do. Okay, well, it's hard. Then have a conversation. He has all kinds of conversations with people. Amen. All right. So God is always speaking to us. He's speaking to us through his word. He's speaking to us prophetically. He speaks to our heart, our soul, our spirit. Uh, and and he, he speaks to us uh, even through his, his commandments. So as we look through the, the, uh, the different commandments, here are the, here are the uh, first five because this is where we are. We've already covered the first one which is have no other gods before me. And uh, you can always look on YouTube and all, the, all of these there for free. Really good uh, teachings and recordings. Please dig in to them. Uh, very revelatory for the modern day church uh, environment. Number two, do not make images to worship. Do not make images to worship. We discussed that, that God's biggest emphasis is not just making an image, but when you're making an image to kind of worship that image, and we talked about that. Number three, uh, do not misuse his name. The King James says take it in vain, but we don't use the word vain too much nowadays. So he's saying do not misuse uh, his name. And we talked about the little boy who cried wolf and how when he cried out for help and people kept coming, he was just playing. And then one day when there really was a wolf and he cried wolf, nobody came because uh, they didn't know if he was serious or just playing. So we don't play with his name we use it correctly because there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen? And there's punishment if you mock that powerful name. All right. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So we talked about that and how rest was designed by God for us. And God wants us to rest and, and we, he wants to be a part of that experience. Uh, that's also on YouTube. So today, here we are on number five. We're on the fifth commandment today. And here's the fifth one, Exodus chapter 20. Uh, verse 12, in the Christian Standard Bible, it says this, Honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. In the New American Standard Bible, it says this, Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be prolonged on the land which the Lord your God gives you. So out of those Ten Commandments, uh, and, of course, we discussed that there's many more commandments in the Old Testament, but the ten are the foundational or the first ones that were given. Um, out of the ten commandments, this is the only, the only commandment that comes with a promise. There's a blessing. There's a promise uh, that comes from obeying this particular commandment as well. And so let's dig in, and then we'll go on to communion, and we'll send you guys home, and I'll move as quickly as I possibly can. So the definition uh, or the, the meaning for the word honor is to regard with great respect. Just keep it simple. To honor means to uh, regard with great respect. But when you look at that scripture verse in the Hebrew uh, uh, or, or the, uh, the, the, the language that it was written in, uh, it uses the, the word uh, kabad, kabad, which doesn't mean honor or respect directly, but kabad means 
to be heavy, weighty, or burdensome. Like, this is strange, but that's what it means. Uh, to be heavy, weighty, or burdensome. And so we take these words, the English word honor, and then the Hebrew word uh, uh, kabed, and then we understand that um, uh, this word to honor or to respect someone is a very heavy thing. It's a very weighty thing, and it can be very burdensome. Uh, that, so heavy and weighty means it's important. I mean, when you're trying to build your house, the cornerstone uh, is not light. It needs to be heavy. Like, the, where you start needs to be heavy. Uh, but also, uh, when it talks about being burdensome, that also means difficult. Because to move a cornerstone, have you ever had a repair in your house, they had to do something with the foundation or move the foundation? That's a very, very difficult thing. So, so we're seeing here just from the description, God is letting us know that what he's asking us to do for some of us, it's going to be very difficult. Because it's easy to honor someone who is honorable. It's easy to respect someone who is respectable. It's easy to love someone who is lovable. It's easy to forgive someone who is forgivable. What happens when your story doesn't look like that? And I've been around long enough to know that at least 60% of us in here, our story might not be so pretty when it comes to a mother or a father or a father figure or a mother figure, and then if you want to go a little further, a spiritual father, a spiritual mother, or one of those figures that did not fulfill the role they were supposed to fulfill in our lives. And not only for some of us, were they not just not there and absent? Let me tell you, for some of y'all, that was a blessing that they were absent, that they weren't there. Because for some of us in this room, they were there, and not only do they not help, but they actually made things worse. They caused pain. They caused sorrow. They caused suffering. And then God is demanding for me to honor them. To honor them. Jesus never said it was going to be easy. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross. And for some of you, your cross is your mom. Your cross is your dad. Even though you don't live with them, you live with the memories. You live with the pain. You live with the hurt. You live with the heartache. And sometimes you live with the request. How dare you call me and ask me for something with the way you treated me when I was little? And some of them will put this verse where the Bible says. But it's interesting on the flip side, because I always look at the way that the Bible is written and, and you know, where things fall in what particular order. It's interesting that earlier in this portion of scripture about the commandments, it says thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because for some of us, we practically worshipped our mother, worshipped our father, or we worshipped our spiritual parents. Even as I was being ordained and moved to position of apostle, uh, I was very uncomfortable with that because I know a lot of people, that's just going to turn them off. Some people don't even believe that there's apostles that exist today. And then for some of them, when you start getting to these deep, higher level positions, all they think about is the abuse and the money that was taken from them and the behaviors and all this and the other. And so for some folks, just call me John. It's all good. Amen. But then I do understand that with that title and position, the anointing and the authority, it opens doors. There's, a, there's an anointing that comes with it as well. So I do carry that, what, in a very heavy way. Come on now. Very, I don't take it lightly. Trust me, none of it. I don't take it lightly. The Bible says that those who have positions of authority and power will be held at a higher level of accountability even on the day of judgment. So don't be running out here just getting these titles because with every level, there's a new devil. And there's a higher level of accountability that God will have towards you as well. So don't get excited. In fact, Jesus told them when they said, who's going to sit on your right and on your left? He said, just be glad that your name is written in the book. Amen. Don't get too excited about these titles. Amen. Uh, but so even with that, uh, there's that understanding 
that some of us, we, we gave too much homage and too much worship and too much glory to our bishops, our pastors, our leaders, this person, that person, the other. And if and when they fell, oh my goodness, we just fell to pieces. Well, part of that's because you were worshiping them too much. You were giving them too much honor. There should be some grief when somebody in your life who uh, has been a mentor to you falls or something happens. There should be a level of grief, but they shouldn't be taking you with them. Mentally, emotionally, psychologically, or spiritually. And if they do or if they can, you've invested too much and they've become an idol in your life. Am I helping somebody this morning? If I'm not, you, I am, whether you know it or not. Amen. I am, whether you know it or not. Myself included. Amen. Honor me, but not higher than what God wants me to be honored. Amen. Because he might get jealous and he might pull me down because of you. So don't do that. Don't put me up too high. Amen, 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 amen. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, so we can get a couple of foundational things straight here. This is a very powerful verse, and I love the way that it's broken down, especially here in the Amplified, and I hope it helps somebody. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. So as I preach today, I'm talking about natural parents. I'm talking about spiritual parents. I'm also talking about anyone who mentored you or a senior person in your life, someone you looked up to you who helped you along the way some, some, somehow or you kind of like submitted yourself to them at some point in your life. So that's going to be an all-inclusive because for some of us, our natural parents weren't really our parents. They were just the birth parents and somebody else mentored that coach or somebody else uh, really imparted into your life to make you the person you are today. So we're going to put all of those together uh, in one category for today's sermon. And I have a verse that actually does that for us as well. So Ephesians 6.1, so we can get the foundation straight. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is, accept their guidance and discipline in his, as his representatives. For this is right, for obedience teach, teaches wisdom and self-discipline. So I did the amplified version, if you, if you have that. I did the amplified just to kind of uh, see some more meatiness there. But in all of the different versions, it says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So if they're trying to get you to do crack, that's not in the Lord. If they're trying you to tell you to cuss, that's not in the Lord. So, so here we understand, if it's, if, it, if it's against Scripture, you, ha, you can and should disobey your parents. It's got quiet in here. Oh, okay, amen, amen, amen. So obedience, who do, we, who, do we, who do we obey more or first, the law, the land, or God? In fact, we obey the law of the land as long as it doesn't conflict with Scripture. The moment it conflicts with Scripture, then we can't obey that. We don't eat the king's meat because we have a bigger king who has better meat. Come on now. And so we, we see in this situation that if your parents are asking you or telling you to do something that is against Scripture, according to the Bible, if it's not in the Lord, you don't have to obey what they are saying. Don't, don't bring that the Bible doesn't talk about washing dishes. Don't play with me. I'm not, I'm not being silly with you. But in this crazy world we live in, we have mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and uncles who pimp their daughters, pimp their sons, do crack with them, sleep with them. I know in, in my own, uh, uh, just being a pastor for 25 years of, of at least three families, three, where the natural father was having sexual relations with his actual natural daughter. That's not even talking about stepfathers and this, that, the other, right? So we have to address these things because they're real. Come on now. We have to address them and talk about them. And how do you bring honor to a man like that and fulfill scripture? So starting off when it comes to obedience. So there's a difference in honor, respect, and obedience. So you don't obey anything if it's against scripture, if it's wrong, if it's illegal, immoral, don't obey your parents with that. They tend to go kill somebody. Uh, what, you, know, you, you don't have to obey that because it's not in the Lord. And you showed them this verse. But then now when it comes to honoring and respecting, how do we handle that even when you have some crazy parents like that? All right. So, so David gives us a good example of how this works. Amen. 
All right, and I promise there won't be a part two of this one. This one is too deep. We're going to hit it today and move on. Woo, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1 through 8. A New Living Translation, please. All right. After Saul, so just so you know, Saul was the king and, and David was a younger man. Uh, in the kingdom of Israel at that time. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. Uh, so Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. Pause there for a second. So he, here we have a situation where King Saul is unjustly trying to kill David. And, and, and David is an innocent person. He's done nothing wrong to Saul at all. In fact, this is after he killed Goliath and, and did Saul a favor because that was really Saul's job to do. Uh, Saul gets jealous of him, and now he's trying to kill the very man who saved his kingdom. So here's what we're dealing with. But I want to pause here for a second because this is a scenario that has happened to many of us. And I want to go deep here, right? So here's somebody who has done something wrong or, or vile or wicked or bad or emotionally disturbing to you, but they've also done some good things as well. They've also done some good things as well. So there's this, there's this tug of war. And uh, I, I, I know of real life situations, and I'll, I'll be crazy enough to raise my hand. I've, I felt the enemy tempt me in this way as well as a leader. Okay, I, I, I understand the voice of the devil. Look, you can't know the voice of God if you don't know the voice of the devil too. If you don't, then maybe what you're hearing is the devil. You, you have to hear both. You have to know that both. If Satan came and spoke to Jesus in the wilderness, then who are you? Come on now. He'll, he'll, come on, come on, come on, come on. So there's many scenarios out there where you hear of people, especially young ladies or whatever, who say with, that or even young men or whatever, they were abused by a pastor or a leader. And sometimes the conversation goes something like this. Well, I've helped you spiritually, and so you can help me naturally. And there's this weird twist of, wow, this person helped my family come out of debt, and it's, they prayed for me, and the prophecy was actually correct, but now he wants me to drop my pants and with where does the, how does the, where does the, and you want to develify this person, but it's like, no, but, but they helped me get out the hood. They put us in a new house. They put us in a new car. And this is the situation. Saul just came off of doing God's will. He was attacking Philistines, but then once he got a moment, that's why some men of God especially keep them busy. Don't be mad when they have too many assignments, because if they don't, you might be their next assignment. Can, can I preach real up in here? I mean, just this year, how many have we seen just in the, the media? That's just the ones that come on now. That, and I always say that when they, when they get caught publicly, that means they didn't, they didn't wrestle with God privately. Because he always gives you a chance to get it right behind the scenes before it comes out. Of, I'm just saying. Okay, I'm just being real. Amen. All right. So, 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 so it makes it difficult because they've also done some good. He slapped me, but he fed me. He raped me, but he paid for me to go to school. And as a stepchild, at least he has some money to help me. And either he's going to beat me or he's going to beat mama. So it's real. It's real. And here come God, honor thy mother and thy father and obey me. And you're like, eh, how do I do this? All right, let's read on. At the place where the, where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in the very same cave. Oh, the flesh and the spirit. I'd have killed them. I just, I'd have just killed him. I'd have just, I don't know about you. I'd just been like, thank you, Jesus. I'd have killed him. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with you as you wish. So David crept forward 
and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe while he was taking a dump. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, and I might start crying up here because this is real for all of us. The Lord forbid that I should do this to, to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men. He had to restrain himself and his men. They're like, yo, dude, I'll do it for you, man. I'll do it for you. And did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My lord, the king, when, and when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Let's jump to verse 11. Look, what does he call him? Is it up there yet? Verse, verse come on, verse 11. Okay, it's coming. He said, Look, my father. Look, my father, look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I'm not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. Now, pause right there. Stop right there. All right. So, so that's where we see here that, that Saul was not his natural father, but he was like a spiritual father to him. In fact, uh, David became his armor bearer at one point in time. You know, Saul gave David his, his daughter to marry. So that's his son-in-law. And there's all these levels and layers of relationship. And David has done nothing wrong. And Saul is, is actively trying to kill him. The Bible says that twice Saul threw his javelin at him, and he had to jump out of the way. Like, this is a real deal. This is a real, this is what, it, what you call an active situation. But let's look at verse, because first, don't go there yet, but verse 12 is going to show us how we handle this. Because God is just, God is fair, but, 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 but God wants you to do things his way. Look, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. you deal with it, you're guilty. If God deals with it, you're innocent. And can't nobody take God to court. Verse 12. Here's what he says. May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you. So, he, so, he, so David wasn't. See, you're mental when you're like, no, it's okay to be raped and molested. No, it's okay. No, David, David wasn't, he wasn't off. He knew exactly what he was dealing with. But David understood one thing, that although his sins were as scarlet, God made him white as snow. David understood that he that is without sin cast the first stone. David understood that I might be a son today, but let me ask you, how many people have you abused? Have you hurt? How many folk will come to a service like this and have to pray about finding a way to even honor and respect you while you're sitting here acting and playing the victim and maybe you victimize somebody else even though it's not in the same way. But if you would have asked them, they wouldn't have something good to say about you because you did not live up to their standard either. David understood the principle. And here's what he said. Let the Lord... The Lord will deal with you. In other words, he was saying nicely, you deserve to be punished, dude. But I choose to not be the one to do it. I'm going to let that sink into your spirit. God is going to hold them accountable, but let the Lord find another way to do it other than through you. So your hands don't have to have blood on them for this. Here's what it says. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me. So he was in his right mind. Because see, part of our prayer today is we need to be in the right mind. Because some of y'all are being abused, but you're, you're excusing it away. 
You need to know I'm not being treated well. I'm not being spoken to properly. You need to be able to categorize that correctly. And you need to be able to say, thank you for giving me a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Thank you for sending me to school. But you're still evil and wicked on this side. I have it clear. And I'm, I'm going to pray that God deals with you. But I'm going to release you so I can move on with my life. Be, be, yes, amen, because here's what happens. When you don't forgive, that means they're abusing you twice. They got you when they got you, and they're still getting you now. And some of them are dead, and they're still from the grave abusing and violating you because you can't let it go. Letting it go doesn't free them. It frees you. You heard the baby girl this morning. She's free. She got free. Come on, man. And the Bible says when you confess your faults, Amen. It's a part of your healing. Yes. Amen. 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 And she says, he says, but I will never harm you. So you deserve to be chopped into pieces, but I'm not going to be the one to do it. And let me ask you a question. Did Saul get his? Oh, he got his. He got his. He didn't get away. He didn't escape. But David was not the one who was put at fault. All right, let's move here. So for some of us, our, our natural, spiritual parents, mentors, figureheads, whatever, some of them used you, some of them manipulated you, some of them lied to you, some of them abused you physically, emotionally, sec sexually, psychologically, and, and part of the healing I wish, I'm not going to do this, I wish some of us could just, just share with the room what they went through because the devil wants you to think you're the only one. You're the only one. I guarantee you're not the only one. Satan likes to get you in a corner, secluded. You're the only one, and you're bad, or something's wrong with you. You're just this, you're just the other. And when you get a chance to hear other people's stories, you realize, wait a minute, this is a class action suit against the devil. Others have gone through this. I'm not the only one, and then there's hope, amen? Some of them tried to kill you. Some have tried to kill you. When you get to heaven, you might be, oh, my goodness, I was sick that week because they actually did poison me. You don't know. Some have tried to kill you in the womb. Some of them tr try to guilt you even now. Well, you know, I'm your mom, and you know, I'm your, you know, you sent me some money, and you know, I brought you into this world, and, and you know, I, I could have I given you up for adoption. I could have aborted you, but I didn't, and, didn't. and they're guilting you. They're guilting you, trying to tear you. And it's hard. It's difficult. And then some of them use you as a negotiation pawn to get your daddy back. You want to see your child? Well, do this. You want to see, well, you're not going to see your child if you, you know. And, they, and some of y'all doing the same thing. Using your kids as chess puzzle pieces. And it's all abuse. It's all wrong. It's all ungodly. When, when, when the father sent the son to the cross, it was only after he agreed to go. They all agreed, okay, we're going to do it this way. It wasn't a forced manipulation. They agreed amongst themselves that Jesus would come and he would give his life. There was no abuse there. It was agreed upon and prophesied. So they all knew it was coming. God wants to bring us to a place where we can forgive our parents, forgive those who, and the reason why I categorize them all together, because at some point in your life, it was someone who had power, it might be a boss, just someone who had authority over you and control that they could manipulate you because either, either you wouldn't get fed or wouldn't have a place to stay or they, you know, they would do something to you and in exchange, either behavior, activities or whatever. Uh, and abuse comes in different ways. The Holy Spirit is telling me one, one form of one of the worst abuses is the way they treat you at home. And it could just be they just don't talk to you or whatever it is. And when you get in public, when you get, praise the Lord, this is my daughter Lily and my son Philip. Say hi to you. <laughs> oh, this abuse. And, and that's not how you treat them in real life. That's abuse. You're making your kids psycho. You're teaching them schizophrenia. You're modeling it. That's abuse as well. Some of y'all lived that. My mom, if you know her, she's the same everywhere. 
I don't bring her here much, but she's the same everywhere. So you don't have to guess. Amen? <laughs> she don't like something, you're going to know it. I don't care what the, if it's a program, a church service, we in court, she's going she's gonna to let you know how she feel. But it's consistent. That inconsistency, that some timeliness. The Bible says in God there's no shadow of turning in him. He don't have a Bible for white people, a Bible for black people, a Bible for good people, a Bible for bad people. He got a Bible for everybody. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God wants to bring us to a place, number one, today where we can start forgiving. That's why we're going to have communion because you can't take communion until you forgive. Got him. Amen. No, but see, but that, that, that's how it's connected. But then number two, to define honor at the very least, if you just have to say, I just thank God that they had me, that might be the only thing you can honor and respect them for. And you know what? That's okay. Just don't dishonor them for the rest. J -j just don't be the one to retaliate on them for the rest. Let the Lord deal with that. But we're not going to tell you to honor dishonorable people who've done this. We don't honor them because they molested and raped you and didn't, whatever it is. If, if all you can find is, hey, they brought me into this world. I thank you, Lord, for that. I bless you, mom and dad, for having me. And that's it. Be truthful. Leave it there and leave the rest to God. But in order to please the Lord, he wants us to wrestle with this. How many times have we been dishonorable to him and he still loves us and forgives us? If you're spirit-filled, whatever that means to you, and you've sinned, that means you brought the Holy Spirit with you into that sin. You made the Holy Spirit lay down with you and that person. And he still forgave you. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord God. I thank you. This, this one is over. But Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Everybody say your word. God, because your word heals, your word reveals, your word deals, your word transforms. And sometimes it's a word that we shout about and other times it's a word that makes us cry. But your word is still the word. And we need it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, not just the good words, not just the democratic words, not just the Republican words, not just the words that line up with our culture, but every word, whether we like it or not, we need it. Strong medicine hardly ever tastes good. And things that are good for you are sometimes hard to swallow and take down. And so, Lord, as your people, we trust you that if you say this is what we need, we will receive it. Whether it tastes bitter or sweet, we declare it is good for us. It is good for our spirit. And, Lord, help us to wrestle with it. I just heard the Holy Spirit say, what if for some of you this is the last thing God's been waiting for in order for your breakthrough to take place? For Moses, it was the circumcision of his son. Read it for yourself. For many people, it's just one thing. For the rich young ruler, it was just one thing. One last thing he had to do, and he wasn't able to do it, and he walked away. And for some of you this morning on this day, it is your parent, your grandparent, that, 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 that uncle, that auntie, that person who had authority over you at some point and they did something bad, something gruesome, or maybe they just weren't there. And God is saying, honor them. Honor them. It's going to be hard to get to that point until you first forgive them for what they did, for what they said for how they made you feel, for how they treated you, or for some of you, how they're still treating you, still manipulating you, not addressing the stuff that they did. Or if it was your mom, maybe she's not addressing the stuff that she allowed your stepfather or her boyfriends to do to you. Maybe she didn't do it, but she didn't stop it from happening. And now you're saved. You're trying to move on, and you're having a hard time doing it. I'm here to tell you, the answer is simple. Forgive. Let it go. Release it. Put it in God's hand. Let him handle the vengeance like David did. 
Although you may have the opportunity to get them back and have revenge and destroy them like David did. Don't do it because God wants to prolong your life. If you make the right decision, he will give you long life. He will prolong your life. You will live to see great things in your future. But you have to take that step today by faith. And for some of you, it's a difficult one. Maybe you're in the audience today and this goes over your head. You had a great mom, a great dad, and great spiritual leaders, and nobody ever made fun of you, and nobody ever put you down. Well, God bless you. This is not for you. But for those of you or those of us who've experienced something, I just heard the Holy Spirit say, for some of you, it was so horrendous, you forgot about it. And now it's coming back up, and you're like, oh, my God, where's my counselor? Where's my crack? I need something right now. The Holy Spirit is here. Let it, let it come forth. We're here as long as we need to be. If the other church comes, we'll take you in the fruit level three and finish ministering to you because God is dealing with something. When we get through these Ten Commandments before the end of the year, the, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to springboard you and this church forward in, in areas you've never seen because now you're honoring me in everything I've asked you to honor me in. And here's what the Holy Spirit said. Don't forgive them for their sake. Forgive them for God's sake. Forgive them because God loves you. Forgive them because you love God. And for those who have to do it by faith, do it by faith. It might be a process, but begin the journey today by faith. We're going to pray for that specifically. I'm not going to have you raise your hand or stand up because some of y'all are here with your parents or your kids or whatever the situation. This is just too gruesome or difficult and you got nosy people in your life that will ask you, what was that all about? Why you raise your hand? I'm just going to pray for the whole audience. I'm going to ask all of us in general as we repeat this prayer. It's a prayer of healing. It's a prayer of deliverance. It's a prayer of God repairing and rebuilding as we seek him by faith to obey this commandment. To honor our father. To honor our mother. Some of us, the people who abuse us, are dead and they're gone. But God says we still need to deal with what's going on in our hearts. And, and it's important to forgive. I'm going to read this portion of scripture to you um, while we're going into prayer. And that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in the New King James Version. Verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord... In an unworthy manner. And part of an unworthy manner is holding any kind of sin, including unforgiveness, in your heart. If you, if you take this communion in an unworthy manner, you will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That means die because of unforgiveness and then taking communion, holding sin and taking communion. For if we would judge ourselves, that means right now you get to judge yourself, we would not have to be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. That means if we don't judge ourselves, God has to judge us the same way he's judging the heathen in the world. Judge yourself this morning by simply forgiving. I'm going to lead you in a prayer like that. The whole audience, if you would trust me enough to say this prayer together, let's say it all together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving me this moment and giving me this opportunity for surely say for surely if you are bringing this up now and you made sure I was in this church today it's for a reason it's for a reason it's for a reason and Lord I know it's because you want to bless me you want to take me higher. You want to take me further. You want to do more in my life. 
And this thing right here might be the last thing I need to remove before my breakthrough. God, help me to forgive anyone who has hurt me, abused me, messed with me, lied to me, put me down, stepped on me, lied about me, especially those who had power or authority. Oh, wait a minute. I just, I just felt the Holy Spirit. Something broke right there. Give me a moment. It will shy. Woo. Because somebody's been holding some witchcraft over some of y'all. And this is breaking that too. Seriously, this is breaking that too. Mm. Say, especially those who held power or authority over my life. I break every connection. I break Every tie in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood over my mind, over my heart, over my soul, over my body, over my spirit. And Lord, help me to forgive. Help me to forgive. And through my forgiving, I shall receive my blessing in Jesus' name. Somebody give God some praise. Come on. As communion is coming, somebody give God some praise. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Let's bless him. Somebody give God some praise right now. You might be praising for the person to your left or the person to your right. Come on, praise. I need you to clap. I need you to praise. Let me tell you something. <laughs> it, you know, it might just be one person who got their breakthrough today. But when Jesus went to Samaria, all he needed was one person. All he needed was one woman at the well, and she got him the whole city. So we don't know who in this building right now, just like the little, uh, like, the, like the calf uh, who was tied up with the mother uh, uh, that got freed and let go. We don't know who got freed today, the donkey. We don't know who got freed today, and you all were a part of that. But I want to encourage you as we prepare for communion. And this is a private thing. Spend some time by your head again and ask God to forgive you, to wash away your sins and cleanse your sins. And as your pastor, I want to tell you, if you got some sins scheduled on the calendar, you have to remove them. You can't pre-repent. So if you got a booty call on Tuesday, it just got canceled. You, you can't repent. Just If you know you're about to do something, you need to repent and then not do it. But take some time as the Holy Spirit. Take a moment. We're going to take one or two minutes just... Allow him to just look into you. Because sometimes the Lord might convict you of something you don't even know was there. You might be carrying some, some lust, some pride, some jealousy, some anger, whatever it is, some bitterness, resentment. Take a moment, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Some of y'all have obvious sins you know of. But just ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Maybe God wants you to call someone and, and get something right. Many times, Lord, I ask you to sow a seed into somebody that you hate. That's that. If that's the Lord, that's not the devil's voice. That's God's voice right there. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If enough of y'all hate me, that'll make my house payment for this month. Amen. But just take some time. Holy Spirit, show me, show me, show me, show me. Amen. As the brethren are coming through, I'm going to start reading. If you want to take communion, just, uh, just raise your hand. pray over this or just okay? Yeah, okay. Heavenly Father, we just pray you bless the elements as they go forth, Lord God, the, the wine and the bread, Lord God, use it for your glory in Jesus' name. So these are going forth. Just, just oh, oh, you're giving me one. I didn't know what was going on. Okay, thank you. Amen. All right, Prince. I was like, why are you still here, man? I already prayed for it. Amen, amen. So as it's cut, just raise your hand if you're taking communion. If you're not, uh, if you're not born again, let, let's handle that. Sorry, let's handle that. If you're not saved, you've never been born again and you're not sure, you need to be saved before you take communion, but you need to be saved, period. Anybody here you want to give your life to Christ, just raise your hand real quick. Save, give your life to, to Jesus Christ, become a, a follower of Jesus. Anybody quickly, amen, praise the Lord. Assuming everyone here has a relationship, they're going to go through, amen. Worshipers, you can come and sing a little bit. Amen, amen, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, as we're taking communion. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Amen. Then we'll close right after we do this. We won't be long. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the
and we'll pause on the song. I love that. We'll definitely continue it. Amen. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Help me with the microphones, please. And the Lord Jesus on the same day, same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Everybody take the bread if you can from the top. We'll begin with that element first. Took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Feel free to break it if you want to. And said when he has given thanks, he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Together, let's eat. Let's eat this bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ. We're part of that body. His love for us. He was willing to sacrifice and give his all for us. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink the cup together. And the beautiful thing about communion, God never tells us how often to do it. You could do communion five times a day. You could do it once a year. But he says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Now, at, at here at Revive, in most churches, they do it once a month. I encourage you to do it at home. Do it with your family. One thing I know for sure, that whenever you do it, whenever you do it, you got to get yourself right with God. Think about that. That's one of God's ways of saying, I want to make sure that you live a repentant lifestyle, that you're always constantly checking your heart. You know, big sins usually start off as little ones. If we can deal with those thoughts and attitudes and imaginations ahead of time before they blow up into bigger things, communion is a great way to do that because it, it reboots you, it resets you. It forces you to examine yourself and say, wow, am I right? Am I right with God? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the move of your spirit today. We thank you, God, for the worship. We thank you for the announcements, the greetings. We thank you for the word, and we thank you for this time in communion. And God, I pray and declare in the name of Jesus that lives have been changed today. God, that those who are wrestling with some of the matters and issues that I talked about, and, and even if we just have a negative attitude towards those who at one point did something for us along the way, God, line those things, get them straight, get our heart right with you. We don't want anything. The Bible says casting down every imagination and anything that would try to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. In this season of our lives, Lord God, we don't need anything hindering the blessings that you have for us, for our church, our ministry, our families, our children. We do not want anything to hinder what you have for us. And so we let it go. We let them go. And we pray for total total freedom in our heart, mind, soul, spirit, and body. Amen. There's a heavy, a heavy anointing in this place. Amen. I want to do a couple of things and we'll see what God does while we're still in this mode. If you'd like to be a member of Revive Church, would you please come to the front? Just leave where you are. Come to the front. You say, hey, I want to go ahead and be a part of this local congregation, this local group. And of course, we'll give you more information and all of that very simple process. If you change your mind, that's okay as well. Anybody for membership, amen, you can come to the front. Uh, if you're online, you can sign up online, or if you want to sign up online later, you can do that as well. Um, I do want to get our prayer warriors in place. I sense that uh, there's a few people in the building that need a breakthrough, that really need a, a breakthrough this morning. So we want to make sure that you, you don't leave if you still have something lingering something you're still kind of dealing with and messing with, please don't leave with that because we've stirred some things up. Don't leave stirred up. Come and get delivered and, and set free because you're in a very vulnerable state. Amen. We've exposed some things and some things that might be at the surface. And please, I, I encourage you to come to the front. Amen. And so as we close out in prayer, 
Amen. Uh, we we uh, uh, we want to make sure uh, you all coming for prayer or amen. Praise the Lord. Praise anybody else. The, the altar is open for prayer. Lord, we thank you for what you've done, what you're doing. Protect us all as we leave this place, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, the altar is open. Don't miss it if you need it. Come on down.